Examination into Natural Law and Two Kingdom Theology. This was recorded with Dr. Nelson Klosterman. If you didn't already, we encourage you to catch up on episode one, and I hope you enjoy what follows. All right. Welcome back to Eschatology Matters. This is installment two uh, of a discussion of NL2K, Natural Law and Two Kingdom Theology. If you did not see the first episode, I encourage you to go back, check the first episode out. Um, we will try to have some resources to help you along. There's a lot of names, articles, um, things thrown out there. So we'll try to have some some lists of resources. But Dr. Klosterman, thank you again for uh, for being with me today. You're welcome. Thanks again for the opportunity. Looking forward to it. Yes, sir. Um, so last time we, we cut it off just on the cusp, on the precipice of looking at some of the confessions. We spoke about... Um, your conception, or not your conception, um, your articulation of NL2K theology, um, what many refer to as R2K or Radical Two Kingdom. Um, you've framed it as Natural Law Two Kingdom. We've walked through the fact that um, the options are not either some radical form of Two Kingdom theology or a you know uh, Reconstructionist theonomic post-millennial necessarily bent. There's a lot more variance within these two. There's a lot more discussions of two kingdoms. You are specifically referring to a brand of two kingdom theology which uh, separates out two kingdoms, a redemptive kingdom and a non-redemptive kingdom, along with all of the things. Again, I, I refer people back to that initial episode. But you were concluding last time with some of the confessions. How do the confessions, especially the Reformed confessions, how do these help us walk through um, this thinking? Because I would dare say this is primarily... Um, this is primarily a debate within Reformed circles. Um, this is this is really a confessional argument. So it, it does well to look at what the confessional documents actually say on this in order to determine what is historical, what is mm -hmm. uh, broadly Reformed in whatever camp one finds oneself. Mm -hmm. Walk us into that a little bit. Well, I, I would ask the uh, listener for uh, a little bit of uh, forbearance and patience and walk along with me as I read some of the very words of the Confessions, and I'll preface my comments by saying that what I'm about to read, dealing with uh, how God makes himself known to us, the role and place of natural reason, natural light, and so on, as well as the role of the state and the civil government, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> as I read these from the Confessions, I have to declare, I have to say that I do not understand how one can argue as current proponents of NL2K argue and claim at the same time to be adhering to the Reformed Confessions. I, I do not, I cannot make that work. Here's an example. Belgic Confession Article 2 is the heading, How God Makes Himself Known to Us. That's a very important comment, uh, topic. How does he make himself known to us? It says, we know him by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe. All right, so we know God from creation, which the Bible calls a book. And it says, the, the Belgian Confession, Article 2 says, wherein all creatures, great and small, are as so many letters leading us to perceive clearly God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, as Paul says in Romans 1.20. Okay? okay, so far, so good. God makes himself known to us in creation. Stop. No, no, we can't stop. Listen, all these things are sufficient. Stop. No. To convict men and leave them without excuse. Mm. That's what the Belgic Confession identifies as the function of this creation revelation. It is sufficient to convict men and leave them without excuse. That's all this article says about that creation revelation. Okay. Now, how you build on that a cultural philosophy where the secular kingdom can be ruled by natural law, what, which people can divine and discern, excuse the pun, from creation, I have no idea. It goes on to say, second, he makes himself more clearly and fully known to us by his holy and divine word, as far as is necessary for us in this life, to his glory and to our salvation. Now, I want to emphasize that latter 
phrase, the Bible, we all know this refers to the Bible. Second, God gives us the Bible. He speaks in creation. The Belgic says that's enough to render you inexcusable if you don't believe and love this God. Then second, he, he uses the Bible. But notice what the Belgic says, as far as is necessary for us in this life. Which is to say, the Bible speaks to all of life. The Bible is necessary for all of life. The Bible's revelation, teaching, is uh, important, relevant for all of life. How somebody can say, well, the Bible has no role in the, in the secular kingdom, I don't understand how that squares with this statement, right. quite frankly. Okay, because that's that's again just kind of catching everyone up. You, you mentioned this in the in the first episode, but this is again um, looking at a bifurcated two kingdoms. And correct me if I'm overusing that term, but a, a sort of bifurcated two kingdoms, um, wherein God's law is the rule for faith and practice in one, and yet it is a kind of a natural conception of common grace or natural law or natural reason, however we however we frame that over here, and you're saying that is incompatible with the way the confession is expressing Well, I, I would clarify one thing, that Absolutely. that um, God's law is operative in the church as well as in creation. Uh, natural law is identified by these advocates as God's law. Mm -hmm. My issue with that has to do with the apprehensibility. How do we apprehend? That's right. Here. Okay. Yep. How do we apprehend that natural law, which I acknowledge is God's law? My answer is Calvin's answer. With the glasses of Scripture, okay. we can that's rightly uh, interpret and apply that natural law. That's good. Okay. Yep. Because because yep. what I definitely don't want to do is misrepresent. Um, you know, right. you, you were doing a lot of that in the the, the first episode. Not, not misrepresenting. You were using a lot of the words and phrases. Um, of proponents of this view, because we're trying to fairly paint it, right, and yet show how how we're di right. differing from. Okay, right. Very good. Okay. Here's another Belgian confession. Article 14. Article 14 deals with uh, the m matter of original sin, the na the corruption of human nature, and so on. Listen to these uh, words. Since man became wicked and perverse, corrupt in all his ways, he has lost all his excellent gifts which he had once received from God. Now again. Do, do people have gifts? Did people have gifts? The answer is yes, they have gifts. They have gifts of, of art, they have gifts of philosophy, they have gifts of logic and reason and language and so on and so forth. People outside of Christ have gifts and abilities. But what is the next sentence? It's all important in the discussion. It says, he has nothing left but some small traces which are sufficient to make men inexcusable. So of all those mighty, magnificent gifts which the philosophers of old admired and praised to the skies, the Bible says, ah, but we have nothing left but small traces which are sufficient to render us, outside of Christ, inexcusable. For whatever light is in us has changed into darkness, as Scripture teaches, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay? Now, let me skip over to the Canons of Dort, because I want to come back to the Belgic Confession regarding the state, the magistrate, and the civil government. Very but good. let's to continue this matter of what I'm calling the inadequacy of the light of nature. Once again, in my interactions, both in print and in uh, discussion and in presentations, I have in vain brought people's attention, the advocates' attention, to Canons of Dort 344. I say in vain because people never respond to my complaint or my criticism here. Listen to what Canons of Dort 344 say about the inadequacy of the light of nature. If we wish to posit that this secular kingdom, this common grace kingdom, this realm is governed by natural law, natural light, that which people can have by virtue only of creation and not redemption. This is what the canons say. To be sure, there is left in man after the fall some light of nature, whereby he retains some notions about God, about natural things, and about the difference between what is honorable and shameful, and shows some regard for virtue and outward order. In other words, there is, that word some is very important. I don't want to delete it. I don't want to deny it that, you know, there are people who are not Christians who don't go around shooting everybody 
and they stay married, and they love their children, and they treat animals nicely, and so on. I mean, there are these kinds of uh, virtues, and there are there is some regard for beauty and for virtue and outward order. But listen to what the canons go on to say. But everything is in this but. So far is he, natural man, from arriving at the saving knowledge of God and true conversion through this light of nature. Okay, that's where the advocates like to stop. <laughs> of course, we acknowledge that people who are outside of Christ cannot use this light of nature to become saved. They don't know salvation from creation, let's say. Look, that's what it says. But it doesn't stop there. It uses a comparison. It says, so far is he from arriving at saving knowledge through this light of nature that he does not even use it properly in natural and civil manners. In other words, there's the comparison. An argument is being made that this sum, which has been identified in the preceding sentence, is not used properly in natural and civil matters. You want something more? Listen to this. Rather, whatever this light may be, whatever this sum virtue is, man wholly pollutes it in various ways and suppresses it by his wickedness. In doing so, he renders himself without excuse before God. Here's where I think the entire ideology and movement of NL2K derails because it refuses to take the Reformation caution uh, to heart that human nature and natural man is so depraved, is so corrupt, is so far removed from the good that it perverts what is left of the good. It misuses it, and it uh, directs it to something that is... Um, to that is evil. So, so that, first of all, from the confessions, and you can see my puzzlement, my consternation that uh, these kinds of confessional statements are, are being ignored. They're being uh, downplayed, or worse, they're being misinterpreted and misrepresented. Okay, now let's go back to the Belgic Confession. I would, I would point out, by the way, before you get into the Belgic Confession, it seems, just, just to help people frame like how this fits, in my mind, this has this is like directly applicable, let's just speculate, if somebody found themselves in a degrading Western society, let's just assume that sort of thing could happen, um, and good is being called evil and evil good and that sort of thing, this helps explain then why those, those spectacles of Scripture like you referenced from Calvin are so necessary in order to determine the good from the evil. Mm -hmm. They... Um, we, uh, there was a book and I'm trying to remember the name of it. It was, it was a sociological study on, it was a specific SS unit in World War II. Um, I think it was called like ordinary soldiers, ordinary men, something, something along those lines. But they, they looked at the lifespans of a lot of these SS soldiers. One in particular always stood out to me. He was a good, you know, quote unquote, good Lutheran father, um, taught his daughter ballet. He would dance with her and stuff. So he had a conception, like you just said, of the good, of the, of the lovely, you know, nice little family. He was a good father to them, provided for them. You, you fast forward not five years down the road, he's one of the key architects in exterminating Jewish people and just all sorts of depravity and, and disgusting behavior toward uh, his fellow man. And and the whole study was saying, like, how does that happen? And, of course, it's a sociological study, so they're looking at power dynamics. They're looking at, specifically in this study, they're looking at the, the coercive uh, power dynamic of following orders and of just kind of dismissing, you know, moral... Uh, moral responsibility because you're following orders but but to me as a christian inherent in that whole discussion is those spectacles are not there so the natural things are still there and yet he he lacks the spectacles with which to see what he is now calling good is actually evil um sorry that just came came yeah. to mind but I, I think that's helpful for us today when 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 I, I would suspect any christian watching this can turn on the news and find any number of moral degradation within our society being called good. Mm -hmm. You're addressing specifically from the confessions, then these are how we determine what that natural law is. Not denying it, but using those proper spectacles of Scripture. Correct. Code. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I, I want to insert this comment that every st sentence that I read, every statement that I read, has Scripture references appended to it. I didn't read those Scripture references. But lest you think, well, this is only some man-made document. 
this is only some confession that a church invented in the time of the Reformation. No, no. These are rooted in the Bible, in Scripture. We'll try to have, I'll, I'll get with you, we'll try to have those those listed as well. Okay. The- All right. Now, let me go back to the Belgic, Article 36. Now, let me tell a little story about this article. You see, uh, Article 36 of the Belgic Confession uh, at one time had words in it that have since been deleted under the leadership of Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bovink. Uh, words that called upon the state to exterminate and eradicate heresy and heretics. And during the time of Kuiper and Bobbing, in Dutch it was 21 words, those words were deleted from the Belgic Confession. And um, not without opposition, I might add. And th- that deletion is seized upon by advocates of NL2K to say, see, there you see, even the Reformed Confessions recognize that in the civil sphere, uh, the church cannot have a say-so, and the Bible doesn't rule and govern things and people in the civil sphere, but we have to appeal to natural law. What absent, they, absent the input of the church. Absent, because, again, you're not arguing for some sort of theocracy no. or, or even a theonomic bent at this point. You're just no. talking about the, the instruction of Scripture even to the civil sphere. Right, yeah. right. Okay. And I'm not defending the 21 words, so to speak. Right. I'm not defending the old version, though there are. that's worth discussing. That's worth discussing. But even without those words, listen to what the re- remaining article says. It says... We believe because of the depravity of mankind, our gracious God has ordained kings, princes, and civil officers. There's a scripture reference. He wants the world to be governed by laws and statutes, no problem, in order that the lawlessness of men be restrained and that everything be conducted among them in good order. For that purpose, he has placed the sword in the hand of the government to punish wrongdoers and protect those that do good. Romans 13, 4. Now listen, their task of restraining and and sustaining, so that's the task of the government, restraining, sustaining. And that means restraining evil and promoting the good. Their task is not limited to the public order, but includes the protection of the church and its ministry in order that the kingdom of Christ may come, comma, the word of the gospel may be preached everywhere, comma, and God may be honored and served by everyone as he requires in his word. I submit to you that those words obligate the government to recognize their identity as liturgists. Mm. That's the liturgia of Romans 13. The liturgia, they are liturgists of God, which is to say that they are commissioned to protect the church and its ministry in order that the kingdom of Christ may come. How can someone argue that the civil kingdom has no relationship to the ecclesiastical or sacred kingdom at all when it says the word that the word of the gospel may be preached everywhere? The government has to protect the preaching of the gospel. It has to secure that according to the confession. Now, you can... You, if you want to disagree with it, disagree with it. If you want to have a, a movement, an ideology, and a theology, a political theology that doesn't do business with this sentence, fine. But then don't claim to be, quote, the reformed view right. of two kingdoms. That is a canard. Right. And that's that's what's so interesting. And again, you know, we kind of mentioned this at the front, and a lot of this is kind of an inter-reformed you know, intramural kind of debate discussion. Um, so that's what's so interesting is is the claims to who owns the confessions. But you don't see a whole lot of engagement with those sort of words. And by the way, were you going to bring up Westminster? Yeah, I have. Okay, you've got that one. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll save that one for you. But that's, yeah, I think that's, that, that, that is key to, especially as you said, it's one thing to say, here is a better understanding of the confessions. We've had such things before. Like you just said, the 21 words, there's been the, the revision of the Westminster from the 1646 to the American version, all those sort of things. But to say this is the historic uh, understanding of the confession, you must grapple then with what it's saying. Right. So, and I'm saying that. that what's left over, even, is con- still sufficient. It's still sufficient to right. contradict the advocacy of an L2K. Okay. Yeah. See. Yep. And then we come to Westminster Confession, and I I have Article 23.3 up here, 
and where it says, yet as nursing fathers, it is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the church of our common Lord without giving any, giving the preference to any denomination of Christians above the rest in such a manner that all ecclesiastical persons, whatever, shall enjoy the full, free, and unquestioned liberty of discharging every part of their sacred functions without violence or danger. So, uh, I'll leave it at that point. And we could add, we could add section two, which still says that the civil magistrate must maintain, um, let me make sure I get it right, piety, justice, and peace. Yes. Which even if you were to, you know, wiggle around how to define justice and peace absent, absent those spectacles of scripture, piety is surely a tough one. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, what else from the confession? That's it. That's okay. all I have That's right now. Yeah. Okay. But I, you mentioned article 23 two. I did not have that here. So I apologize for that. But you mentioned it, and I would encourage our listeners to to take a look at that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're walking through then the confessions, the issues with the 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 view of NL2K, which again, just to overly reiterate, a separation of a redemptive kingdom and a non-redemptive kingdom. Um, we're saying no. Instead, the confessions themselves lend toward a unified, integrated. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Integrated plan of God. That all of Scripture, including the covenants, including what's reflected in the confessions from Scripture, this is a Christocentric, Christotelic uh, vision of Scripture. And in other words, that God's redemptive plan does not have something um, separated out from its redemptive scope. You know, this concludes episode two of this three-part installment or three-part series examining natural law and two kingdoms theology with Dr. Nelson Klosterman. If you didn't already, I encourage you to catch up on episode one, and we hope you'll join us for episode three. Seated here at my right hand, the Lord to my Lord did command, for of these ye then I will make a kingly Say. Don't